What's this? A letter for me. Welcome to another episode of Remember the Great Sports Through the Mail Thursdays. Today I'm going to sh share with you three profiles of three people that just recently signed autographs through the mail for me. So we're going to jump right into this. And the first one is from Nebraska. And it is a return from former outfielder Thad Bosley on one, two, three as a Royal and four as a Royal. So two as a Cub and two as a Royal. So let me tell you about Thad Bosley and his career in baseball. Thad Bosley, a California native, was a left-handed hitting tall outfielder that was drafted in the fourth round of the 1974 draft out of Oceanside High School in Oceanside, California. At just 17 years old, he was assigned to rookie ball of the California Angels and appeared in 68 games for them that season. The following year, in 1975, he was assigned to their A-ball affi affiliate where he appeared in 108 games and batted a respectable 298 that season and stole 37 bases. The next year, in 1976, at just 19 years old, he remained in A-ball and he appeared in 134 games that year, posting a 324 batting average and stealing 90 bases in 1976 for the Angels' single-A affiliate. Well, in 1977, the Angels decided to have him jump over double-A and assigned him to the triple-A affiliate. In just 69 games with their triple-A affiliate, he posted a 326 batting average and stole 23 bases. The Angels took notice of Thad's pro progress, and they called him up on June 29, 1977, at just the age of 20 years old. Thad put together a pretty solid rookie season in 58 games. He posted a 297 batting average uh, while playing the outfield for the California Angels. Well, after that 77 season concluded, Thad was traded along with Bobby Bonds and Richard Dotson to the Chicago White Sox for veteran Brian Downing, Dave Frost, and pitcher Chris Knapp. Well, going into 1978, uh, Thad split the season between AAA and AA. While he was in AAA, he posted a 291 batting average, and while he was in Chicago, his batting average was 269. 1979 was more of the same, where he would split most of the season between AAA and the majors, and he would appear in just 36 games for the White Sox that year in 1979, but he posted a 312 batting average. Well, in 1980, he would make the team full-time, and he would be uh, primarily a left-handed bat uh, in the outfield, and he would appear in 70 games for the White Sox in 1980. Well, after that 1980 season concluded, he was traded on April 1st the next year, right on basically right before the season started, to the Milwaukee Brewers. Well, with the Brewers, he would split time between AAA and the majors, appearing in 42 games in the majors and 34 games in the minors. And after that 81 season, he would then be traded again, packing his bags, to the Seattle Mariners. He would spend one season with the Seattle Mariners, and then the Mariners would let him go from his contract after splitting time between Seattle's AAA affiliate and the majors. He would then sign in 1983 with the Cubs, Again, splitting time between the majors and their AAA affiliate. In 1984, it would be more of the same, returning to Chicago Cubs, appearing in 51 games in AAA for the Cubs, and appearing in 55 games for the Cubs and the majors. In his time in AAA in 1984, he posted a 358 batting average in AAA and posted a 296 batting average in the majors. Well, in 1985, he more or less had a full-time outfield spot for the Cubs. The Cubs placed him in the outfield, and he responded batting 328 that year for the Cubs. 1986 rolled around. He would appear in just 87 games for the Cubs. However, he wasn't in AAA, and he posted a 275 batting average, basically primarily being a left-handed hitter off the bench and a platoon outfielder. After that 86 season concluded, he was then traded by the Cubs nearly right before the 1987 season started to the Kansas City Royals for veteran catcher Jim Sundberg. Well, while he was with the Royals, he 
appeared in 80 games in 1987. Again, a solid bat off the bench, posting a 279 batting average. After that 87 season concluded, he came back in 1988 with the Royals. Uh, however, after spending 15 games in AAA for the Royals that year, the Royals decided to release him, and he signed with the California Angels, the team that originally drafted him. Well, he moved back for his homecoming to the California Angels, and he split time between their AAA affiliate and their Major League affiliate in 1988. And when he concluded the year in 1988 with the Angels, he was granted his free agency. Well, he decided to sign uh, midway through the 1989 season with the Texas Rangers. He would finish out the year in the uh, Rangers AAA affiliate, but he also appeared in 37 games for the Rangers in a part-time outfield role that season. In 1990, he would then return to the Texas Rangers for that 1990 season. Uh, after struggling the first couple months, the Rangers decided to let him go and release him from his contract on June 2, 1990. So in total, Bozzi played parts of 14 Major League seasons in the Major Leagues, appearing in 784 games in 1,500 at-bats, posting a lifetime 272 batting average, and hit a career total of 20 home runs. So, obviously, early on in his career, he had a, you know, a different role. He was, you know, a speedster on the base paths, and as he transitioned to his major league positions, he uh, kind of became like a utility outfielder, you know, pinch hitter type uh, towards his uh, heyday as a major leaguer. Uh, after he finished up in his playing careers, uh, Bosley would resurface as a coach with the Oakland A's. He held that position from 1999 to 2002. He also decided to uh, coach at the collegiate level where he coached at a now defunct university, Bethany University, and also at Southwestern College in Phoenix, Arizona. After he was at Southwestern College for a season, he, just, he became the Texas Rangers hitting coach for a season. Uh, he was let go in June of 2011 after that. Uh, after his uh, career finished up, or I guess another side note is, is along with teammate Lenny Randall, he actually briefly became a member of a funk group called the Ballplayers, which featured former major leaguer journeyman himself, Lenny Randall. Some of their music can be heard on a compilation called Family Album, which was released in 2010 on the DC-based music label, People's Potential Family. So I've never heard of that, but Thad was part of a group. <laughs> I'm not really sure what Thad's up to nowadays. However, I know he lives in Nebraska. Not sure what he's doing in Nebraska, but um, very happy to add his autograph to my collection. We'll move on to the next one. All right, so this next return is also from a journeyman, I guess you would call it. And that is a return from former Oakland A slash Baltimore Oriole, of course, Rich Bordy on 404. And as you can see, I have him as a Yankee, an A, and an Oriole. But he has a couple other teams, and I'm going to tell you about those in a second here. So let me tell you about Rich Bordy and his playing career in baseball. Rich Bordy was originally drafted by the Minnesota Twins, but he decided not to sign uh, out of high school with the Twins in 1977 and instead elected to go to college at California State University. Well, a couple years later, in 1980, the Oakland A's made Rich Bordy their third round pick of the 1980 draft. According to his Wikipedia page, He's the last player that the infamous Charlie Finley signed to a contract. So that's something right there. The colorful character of Charlie Finley, this guy's the last professional contract that was signed. Well, with his first year with the Oakland A's organization, he was assigned uh, to double A. And after starting nine games, appearing in 11 games for their double A affiliate, Rich Bordy got his call to the majors. At just 21 years old, on July 16th, Bordy got his chance to go to the majors where he appeared in his one and only game in that 1980 season. And after making that one appearance for just two innings, he'll wind up finishing his total season in 1980 in AA. Well, the following year, 1981, the A's decided to move him up to AAA. And while he was in AAA, 
He appeared in 27 games that year, starting 27, posting a 9-11 and record. Well, in 81, he also got a couple more appearances in Oakland, appearing in two games for them that season. However, after that 81 season, he was traded to the Seattle Mariners for veteran Dan Meyer. Well, with Seattle, spent most of the year in AAA. He posted a 12 win, 9 loss record in 25 starts for their AAA affiliate. He did get his call up to the big leagues for the Mariners and he appeared in 7 games for the Mariners that year, but things didn't go so well where he posted a 0 and 2 record with an 8.31 ERA. After that 82 season concluded, the Mariners decided to package him in a deal to the Chicago Cubs for Steve Henderson. Well, the next year, in 1983, the Cubs would send him to their AAA affiliate, but after posting a 7-2 and record in 18 games, he got his call to the major leagues, and he was pitching in Wrigley Field. So if you're keeping track, this is his third team now in the four years that he pitched in a major league game. Well, with the Cubs, he went 0-2 and with a 4.97 ERA that year. In the following year, in 1984, he made the Cubs opening day roster and remained there the entire season, and he actually posted... Uh, five and two record with a 3.46 ERA in 31 games that year for the Cubs. Well, apparently the Yankees were impressed with uh, Rich's performance in Chicago because the Yankees traded in the off season for Rich uh, from the Chicago Cubs. Rich would spend that 1985 season playing in Yankee Stadium, appearing in 51 games, posting a 3.21 ERA with a six and eight win loss record. Well, despite having a decent season with the Yankees, the Yankees decided to package him in a deal along with Rex Hudler to the Baltimore Orioles for Gary Rinicky. So this is how Rinicky became a Yankee, and Rex Hudler became, uh, I guess, a Baltimore Oriole. And with the Orioles that year in 1986, he would post a six-win, four-loss record with a 4.46 ERA and 52 appearances. Going into 1987, he was with the Orioles. However, they decided to release him right before the season started, and he signed again with the New York Yankees. After some tune-up work in 25 games in 1987 in AAA for the Yankees, he'd be called back to Yankee Stadium. However, his ERA would balloon to 764, but he would post a three-win, one-loss record. The Yankees decided to let him go after that 87 season, and he would sign again with that team that originally drafted him, the Oakland A's. Rich would make his second stint with the Oakland A's. Uh, he would appear in just two games in 1988, which this would be the A's team that would go on to the World Series to play the Dodgers. However, he spent the majority of that season playing in their AAA affiliate. The following year, in 1989, he would be still stuck in AAA, and he would post a 4-6 and six record and a 3.61 ERA in 41 appearances, but not get a call back up to the majors that season in 89. After the 89 season concluded, Rich would sign with the San Francisco Giants. In 1990, he would appear in just four games for their AAA affiliate before he hung it up, uh, hung the cleats up as a player. So after his career as a player, Rich got into scouting, and actually... He became a scout that worked for the Cincinnati Reds organization for a very, very long time. As a matter of fact, there was a retirement announcement in the summer of 2023 that Rich would have finally officially retire from baseball after many, many years of service in the Reds organization. So Rich played, bounced around with a lot of teams. He was a journeyman for sure, pitcher. Uh, then he got a job in baseball as a scout, and he did that for a very long time, you know, almost almost uh, 30 plus years as a scout and very happy to add Rich to the all-time Orioles collection. We're going to look and see if we can get some of these other guys to sign this rookie card and we'll move on to the final return. All right, so this is a return from former All-Star Johnny Ray on his rookie card, just like the 82 tops that Rich Bordy was on. 1987 tops with gum stain. I uh, didn't realize that gum stain was on the back of this card until after I sent it to Johnny. So I guess that just adds to the lore. 1988 Fleer with Johnny and a nice 1989 Donruss Diamond Kings. So let me tell you about Johnny Ray and his career in baseball. 
Johnny Ray, an Oklahoma native, played his high school baseball in Oklahoma, but then went on to play his college baseball at the University of Arkansas, where he finished the 1979 season going to the College World Series with the Razorbacks. Ray was selected by the Houston Astros of the 12th round of the amateur baseball draft of that season. Starting out the year in 1979 with the rookie ball and A affiliate of the Houston Astros, Ray appeared in 61 games and posted a 280 batting average between the two stops. The following year in 1980, he was promoted to Double A, where he appeared in 138 games and posted an immaculate 324 batting average for the Astros Double A affiliate. The next year he was challenged at Triple A and he took the challenge in stride. In Triple A, he batted 349, stole 19 bases, had 83 RBIs with 5 home runs in 131 games for the Astros for their Triple A affiliate through August 31st, 1981. Well, this didn't go unnoticed, and the Pittsburgh Pirates made an offer to send Phil Garner to the Houston Astros in return for their hot hitting prospect. The Astros traded him to the Pirates, and before he knew it, on September 2nd, 1981, Johnny Ray was playing second base in the major leagues for the Pittsburgh Pirates. He would finish out the year, appearing in 31 games for the Pirates that year, and the following year, in 1982, the job was his at second base. Ray responded with his first year in the major leagues, playing a solid second base as a switch hitter, betting 281 with 16 stolen bases, 7 home runs, and 162 games for the Pirates in 1982. The following year, in 83, he would appear in 151 games for the Pirates, bat 283, and hit 5 home runs and steal 18 bases. By 1984, Ray was the standard at second base in Pittsburgh, and he would maintain his position with the Pirates all the way through the midpoint of the 1987 season. Ray would post numbers that were superior, however still had made his first All-Star game, but he was traded on August 29, 1987 to the California Angels. He would finish out the 87 season, appearing in 30 games for the Angels, and he would po post a 346 batting average that first year with the California Angels. In the next year, in 1988, at the age of 31 years old, Ray would post a 306 batting average, making his first All-Star appearance of his career at the age of 31 for the California Angels. The following year, in 1989, Ray would again have a decent season for the California Angels posting a 289 batting average in 134 games. In 1990, he would drop down to just 105 games and a 277 batting average. Well, despite having a little bit of an off season, the California Angels at his age 33 season decided to release him from his contract and not bring him back for the 91 season. Well, the story didn't end there for Ray, as he decided to sign with the Yukolt Swallows of the Japanese Professional Baseball League for the 1991 season. He would spend the 1991 season and the 1992 season playing for the Yukolt Swallows, and after he retired from his professional baseball career, both playing in Japan and in the major leagues, he decided to go back to his hometown in Oklahoma, and still to this day resides in his boyhood hometown where he went to high school in Oklahoma. And you can actually see the sign in this small town, the home of Johnny Ray. So Johnny Ray, growing up, to me, was one of my favorite ball players because I remember playing as him on RBI Baseball 2 and 3, if memory serves me right. And he was always a great switch hitter with a lot of speed on those games. Uh, I also have, you know, contacted Mr. Ray a few times in my life, you know, through the mail. He's always been a great, great signer for those that want his autograph. And, you know, I, I'm one that has always wanted his autograph. I've gotten this card signed a couple times by all three of these players. So you might be seeing this card again <laughs> in future episodes, uh, you know, with Bob Long. I also want to thank Rich Bordy for signing his card as well. Hopefully I'll be able to get that signed. I'm probably going to send this to Rick Dempsey 
and ask him to sign this as well because he's a pretty good signer through the mail for a small fee. I also want to thank Thad Bosley for signing a couple more 87 tops, which is absolutely my favorite set of all time, along with a couple other 86 and 88 Fleer. I want to thank you for taking the time to watch this video. I hope you learned a little bit about some players that you may or may not have known from the 80s. These guys have tons of cards out there in the junk wax era, so if you want to add them to your collection, definitely consider doing so. Thank you for your time and watching, and as always, happy collecting.